for tonight. Yes. And uh, we are continuing our series on joy. Yes. And uh, as we get into this holiday season, it can be very difficult yes. at times to really seek and look for uh, that kind of peace that we need uh, as we're addressing the struggles of holiday season. It's supposed to be a fun time, but at times people feel so stressed and so little joy. So as we look at this, I want us to look at Philippians. We started at this last week. We were in Philippians chapter number uh, 1. We're going to be looking at verses 12 through 20 tonight. And the title of the teaching tonight is going to be um, it's all in how you look at it. It's all in how you look at it. So in tonight's lesson, we, we want to know that really what we have to look at, it, it's our attitude that really determines whether we have joy in whatever circumstances that we're in, right? Amen. I mean, attitude plays a, a heavy role in how anything can happen in our lives. So I want us to turn to Philippians chapter number one. I want you to begin looking at verse number 12. I'm going to read through verses 12 through 20, and then we're going to go through it in segment. And as you're watching tonight, um, we'll give you a moment to be able to get into your Bibles and see this too. Philippians chapter number one, we'll begin at verse number 12. Again, the title of the, of the teaching tonight, it's all on how you look at it. Uh, talking about how do we restore and maintain our joy. So, Philippians chapter 1, verse 12. Let me begin by reading. But I would you should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all of the places. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the words without fear. Some indeed preach Christ, even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds. But the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then? Paul continues to write, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therefore am do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. And then verse 20, according to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. So, when we're looking at this lesson tonight, and we're talking about attitude, and everybody has an attitude, right? Right. <laughs> we see it when we're driving down the road. We see the attitudes that people can have. We see when we pull into our church parking lot, how our attitudes can change when we can't find a parking spot. Right? Attitude. Attitude determines whether we have joy in our circumstances or not. But by attitude, I do not mean foolish optimism, like so many express today in the power of positive thinking. That's not what I'm talking about. It's not like the man who fell off a building, uh, a 40-story building, and as he dropped past the 10th floor, he was heard saying, so far, so good. Yeah. Heading down. Yeah. See, you, you can see the attitude that I'm talking about tonight in a story about a woman named Maureen Jones, a 92-year-old woman when she was moved to a nursing home, her husband of 70 years had recently passed away, making the move necessary. And after many hours of waiting patiently in the lobby of the nursing home, she smiled sweetly when told that her room was ready. And as she maneuvered her little walker to the elevator, she was provided with a visual description of her tiny room, including the eyelid sheets that had been hung on her window. 
She said, I love it. And she said it with the enthusiasm of like a, a, an eight-year-old child just having been presented with a new puppy. And they said, Mrs. Jones, you haven't even seen the room yet. Just wait. And she said, that doesn't have anything to do with it. She said, happiness is something you decide on ahead of time. Yeah. Whether I like my room or not doesn't depend on how the furniture is arranged. It's how I arrange my mind. I already decided to love it. So it's a decision I make every morning when I wake up, she said. I have a choice. I can spend the day in bed recounting the difficulty I have with the parts of my body that no longer work, or I can get out of bed and be thankful for the parts of my body that do work. Attitude, that's what we're talking about today. Each day is a gift, and as long as she said, as long as my eyes are open, I'll focus on this new day that God has given me. I'll focus on all the happy memories that I've stored away just for this time in my life. Now, that's a wonderful way to begin the day, and what a wonderful outlook on life. But the moment we get out of our homes, or sometimes the moment we get out of bed, there are things that could hit us. It could be a spouse that's cranky, not that I have one, thank God. It could be your children who you're trying to get up out of bed and getting them ready for, for school and they're cranky. And, and, and does that have an impact on your attitude? I can remember as my children were little how my attitude could really change and shift based on the actions and the reactions of my children. And, and, and so when we look at this, and I think of this 92-year-old woman and what she is saying, it, it's just amazing because we look at attitude and we're like, well, I can control my attitude. But we're going to see in Scripture tonight how the Apostle Paul shows how that can be done. So what a wonderful way, I said, it is to begin at the day, and what a wonderful outlook on life. And so the Apostle Paul displays such an attitude of joy in his letter to the Philippians. You see, remember, Paul had dreamed of going to Rome as a preacher in order to present the gospel to the emperor, Nero. Instead, what happened to Paul? He wound it up in Rome as a prisoner awaiting trial. The details of the experience that Paul sums up in verse 12 in the sparse phrase, he said, The things which happened to me, the things which happened to me. And that's given in Acts chapter 21, verse 7 through, through uh, Acts chapter 21, verse 7, and then verses 28 and 31. We're told here in Acts, he says, here we're told that he was arrested on false accusations. Yeah. You see that in Acts, what happened? He was misrepresented before the court. He was incorrectly identified as an Egyptian renegade. Think about that. He was kept in prison because of official craving for popularity. Now think about that. How would you react? You know, uh, I just saw on the news um, last night uh, an African-American couple that went into a store, and when they went out of the store, they got into their car, and as they began to drive away, the police came and pulled them over. And when they pulled them over, they were being accused of shoplifting, and these people shopped in the store all the time. And so they were escorted back to the store, and they went to the people that they know in there, and they said, are you accusing us of stealing something? And the response from one of the storekeepers was, well, if the shoe fits. And so now there's all of this stuff that's going on in the media, because here's a couple that didn't steal anything, but they feel like that they're being profiled. Yeah. But their whole attitude through this whole experience was one of, okay, why are you doing this without getting angry and, 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 and throwing everything back? So, so Paul is showing us here that even when things come against us, how we act or react plays into our attitude. Right. And can I find peace and joy in situations that aren't always comfortable? Remember, Paul was, was held there and, and people kept him in prison for money. And through a show of false legalism, he was kept in prison. And when Paul finally reaches Rome, he was incarcerated and all but forgotten for two long years. 
Yeah. How would you like that to happen to you? Yeah. Yet through it all, what happens? Paul, in the letters we read, he maintains a joyful outlook on life. <laughs> Sometimes I look, I say, how did you do it, Paul? Yeah. You know? And tonight I want us to examine how he managed to do that. So as we look at verses, Philippians verse uh, one, chapter 1, verses 12 and 14, I want to point out several key points here. First of all, verses 12 through 14, I want you to see first that we can be joyful in spite of our circumstances. Yeah. So, so let me read again verses 12 through 14, just so that you're with me. And as you're watching tonight, uh, I'll read this to help you if you don't have a Bible in front of you. So it says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 12 through 14, it says, But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are more bold to speak the word without fear. Now, there's another version of the Bible that translates these scriptures in this manner, and it's called the Message Bible. And I want to read this version for you so you can see a different flavor to this scripture. It says, I want to report to you, friends, that my imprisonment here has had the opposite of its intended effect. Instead of being squelched, the message has actually prospered. All the soldiers here, and everyone else too, found out that I'm in jail because of this Messiah. That piqued their curiosity, and now they've learned all about him. Not only that, but most of the Christians here have become far more sure of themselves in the faith than ever, speaking out fearlessly about God and about the Messiah. Yeah. So Paul could be joyful in spite of his circumstances because he did not see himself as a victim. Right. Think about that. When we see ourselves as victims, we are nothing more than the sum of the things that have happened to us. But Paul said in verse 12, the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. So that word translated furtherance, prokopin, sometimes translates into progress. And it's a word used to refer to army engineers who went before the troops to open the way to new territory. So Paul could be joyful in spite of his circumstances, because he viewed the guard he was chained to as a captive audience, not an infuriating restriction. He's got somebody chained to him, and he's saying, hey, this is great. I've got a captive audience. Now, how can a person think like that? Think about it. The answer really depends on the question we ask ourselves when we face such situations. What, how would you respond? You know, write down these two questions. I'd like for you to do this. Go ahead and write down these two questions. Either we ask the negative, and here's the first question. Why did this thing, or why did this have to happen to me? Why did this have to happen to me? And the second question that you want to write down is a positive question. And that question is, what does God have in mind to benefit me in this situation. What does God have in mind to benefit me in this situation? Yeah. And if you're watching tonight, you could even just write to us and tell us as you make comments uh, and, and respond to those questions. Because in verse 13, it says in Philippians chapter 1, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ, yeah. right? right? So the palace guard literally is a translation which referred to a people which were called the Praetorian Guards. Now the Praetorian Guards at that time were the emperor's bodyguards, which consisted of several thousand elite Roman soldiers stationed at key residences of the emperor. So these were the elite of the elite. 
that protected the emperor and all of his places. So these soldiers not only protected the king, but they were also responsible to be in charge of all of the imperial prisoners. And that's where the apostle Paul found himself. Right. So the word chains, in some translations it's bonds in scripture, in verse 13, is a technical term that denotes a short chain used by coupling a prisoner's arm to a guard's arm. So there's not a lot of room. It's not like he had a chain that was three feet long and he could go around the corner and not look at the guard. But it was a very short chain. So Paul was chained to a soldier, and the soldiers rotated every four to six hours. Remember, I shared this with you before, this story, and, and I just wanted to reemphasize it so that you can see here what we're looking at and how in Paul's circumstances, he still could find joy right. no matter right. what was happening. Right. He right. looked at what can I get out of this yeah. to be a blessing for the furtherance of the kingdom of God. So here, remember, for a two-year period, Paul had a captive congregation as the finest regiment in the Roman army was literally chained to Paul in, in rotation for four to six hours a day. Now, can you imagine what the talk was like in the barracks at night when these guards would be away from Paul and they would go back to their rooms? I mean, I, mean, I, I, I kind of think about, well, what kind of duty did you get today? Tonight. One would ask the other and, and one would say, man, I was chained to this little Jew from Tarsus that everyone is talking about. All he talks about is some guy named Jesus who was crucified but supposedly rose from the dead. He says that this Jesus is alive, but we know that no one ever survives a Roman crucifixion. So the conversation, you think, could be going on. And all this Paul does, and all this Paul does is he says either dictates a letter to other groups of followers, that's what he's doing of Jesus, or people come to see him, and he talks about Jesus. So they're sharing with each other, this is what's happening, and I'm seeing while well, I'm chained to Paul. Every hour of every day, all he does is talk about Jesus. Now, it would hardly um, come as a surprise that a number of the soldiers chained to Paul came to be believers in Jesus themselves. Yeah. Think about that. Because not only did Paul preach it or teach it, but Paul lived it. And we as Christians sometimes, we forget that we are an ambassador of Christ. And therefore, when we are out there in the community, no matter what situation is going on in our lives, people are watching us. They're listening to what we say. And they're wondering that in that crisis, how do you handle yourselves? Mm -hmm. And so often it's so easy to justify and say, I can understand why they got upset. Because what was done to them was wrong. But as a Christian, Paul is saying, look, I may not like the fact that I've been thrown in prison when I don't deserve to be there. In right. fact, I don't like the fact that I'm chained to somebody. <laughs> but instead of looking at the negative aspect of it, how can I make this work out for good right, to be a right, light right. into a dark world? Right. How can I be the salt of the earth to people around me, even in the most difficult times of my life? It's talking about feeling joy. Yeah. Right. We're moving into Thanksgiving and Christmas and, and the stresses that come with it. And, and we can be so caught up in what presents do I have to buy or how many people do I have to feed at Thanksgiving that we lose the joy yeah, of right. why we come together. Yes, that's right. And Paul said, hey, look, and, and I don't know about you, but I think I would rather worry about how many people come to my house for Thanksgiving than being chained to somebody for two years. So it's amazing. Paul was literally chained to a soldier, a Roman soldier. But in another sense of the word, we all have restrictions in our own lives that limit our ability to serve as we would like to, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we can, we can think of that and see that. I mean, as you're watching tonight, you can even think about the limitations that, that you have in your own life that, that keep you from coming up to church. Right. And you say, well, how can I be a benefit? How can I be a blessing? And are you chained to a desk at work? What kind of chance do you have to serve Christ if you work a full-time job? I've heard people say that. Are you chained to an illness? What can you do when you are in poor health? Yeah. You can pray, you can come to church, you can do many things. I, I, or perhaps you're chained to a two-year-old. 
No, not you. Yeah. <laughs> or someone that acts like a two-year-old. <laughs> what can you do to serve Jesus? Look, folks, you're missing this. They're pointing, people here are pointing fingers at each other. <laughs> what can you do to serve Jesus when you are too busy at home raising your kids? You see, when we are young, it may be the children. When we are in the middle aged, it may be all of our responsibilities. Yeah. When we are older, it may be our health. But we all have limitations. Right. Can I get an amen? Amen. 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 Right. We must meet the challenge of not seeing all of these things as discouragements. But rather, we need to view them as God-given opportunities. Right. Yes. Wow. You know, when, when our car was broken into uh, several years ago and Michaela's Bible was stolen, you know, we're frustrated at first. We're like, you know, why would they steal her Bible? You know, and there were papers taken out of the car, and we walked down the street, and we found the, my registration and other things on the side of the street. You know, they ransacked everything and grabbed and took off. Never found the Bible. And then so Michaela and I would talk afterwards, and we would just kind of imagine and say, you know, maybe somebody is opening it up. Or if they ditched it somewhere, somewhere else, someone else picked it up. Yeah. And we thought of Romans 8, 28. All things work out for the good to them that love the Lord, to them that are called according to his purpose. So we, instead of being discouraged by it and allowing that to impact us, we said, God, that Bible being seated in that car and somebody breaking into it, we pray that it helps somebody somewhere. Right. And if anything, it helps us to realize that we are not dependent on that Bible to make it to heaven. We're dependent right. on our relationship. That's with right. Amen. 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 So, when I think of this, and I, I look at what I go, what's going on here, Paul's conclusion in verse 14 was that most of the brethren, he says here in verse 14, most of the brethren of the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. The way that Paul had handled the difficult circumstance in his life had helped his fellow believers, think about this, become more confident and service for the Lord. That's why I say how we act, we act, interact with others in our situations, in our limitations, can give strength to someone else. Doesn't all the scripture say that we come together to build one another up? Right, right. right. We add, we give strength one to another, right, right. and that's how we can do that. So if Paul could be courageous enough in his harsh circumstances to be a witness for Jesus. Then these other Christians now realized they also could be courageous in sharing Jesus Christ. Wow. Yeah, I wonder. Is there anyone who is encouraged in the faith by what they see demonstrated in your life? Is there anybody that, that, that looks at you and says, you know what, the way that you live your life is an encouragement to me in my faith that I can grow? I wonder. You see, we can be joyful in spite of our circumstances. Now, the second point that I want to bring up tonight is that we can be joyful in spite of what others do. Let's look at verses 15 through 18 of Philippians chapter number 1. It says, some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains, but the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and in this I rejoice, yes, and will rejoice. Now, I like also the message situation, the message Bible that translates these verses. It says, it's true that some here preach Christ because with me out of the way, they think they'll step right into the spotlight. <laughs> but the others do it with the best heart in the world. One group is motivated by pure love, knowing that I am here defending the message, wanting to help. The others, now that I'm out of the picture, are merely greedy, hoping to get something out of it for themselves. Their motives are bad. 
They see me as their competition. And so the worse it goes for me, the better they think for them. So how am I to respond? I've decided that I really don't care about their motives. I love the way they write this. Whether mixed, bad, or indifferent, every time one of them opens his mouth, Christ is proclaimed. So I just share them on. Wow. Rivals of Paul used his imprisonment as an opportunity to advance their own personal agendas. Isn't that amazing? You have a tough time at work, and isn't there always somebody there that's saying, good, I, I, you know, this now opens the door for me to be able to get this if, if they're being pushed back there. Sure. And some people, that's the way they operate in their lives. But Paul's attitude towards others who were making Jesus Christ known is not only charitable, but also it's exemplary. The beautiful thing about Paul's attitude was his unwillingness to allow anyone to make him bitter or resentful. I like that. I'm not going to allow you and your attitude to change my attitude. Right? Yeah. right? And that's, that's how we got to take hold of that. Now, Sometimes it seems it's hard to do, but when we have Christ as the center and the foundation of our life, and we seek him first, then that allows us to become less and him to become more in our lives. So essentially, Paul is saying that as long as these people were preaching salvation by grace, alone through faith alone, in Christ alone, Paul could live it. He's saying, hey, as long as you're preaching and doing the work, I don't care who gets the glory. Right. <laughs> right. So, some people look and they say, hey, you know, uh, well, you know, we, we've got to have this number of people in our church and we've got to have this and that. And my focus is it's not about the numbers, it's right. about our lives and do they really exemplify right. our Lord and Savior? Yeah. Yeah. Am I truly his ambassador? Do I represent Christ in all actions and all attitudes and in all places? Right. It's, a, it's a good question. I heard a preacher once say, the hardest instrument to play in all of God's orchestra is second fiddle. <laughs> but the principle, as Paul sees it, is that if Jesus Christ is number one, yeah. then you and I don't need to worry about who is number two. Yeah, yeah. that's right. 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 So we can be joyful in spite of what others do. Right. And third, we can be joyful in spite of how uncertain the future may look. Now look at verses 19 and 20. These are the last two verses here we're looking at. Paul knew that all that had happened would end in his deliverance. Now, did the Apostle Paul mean that he knew that God would deliver him by releasing him from his imprisonment? No, not necessarily. That's not what he meant, right? It, it is probable that he was not referring to the physical deliverance in the form of release from prison because he clearly indicates in verses 20 and 21 that he was prepared to die for the sake of the gospel right. if that was necessary. Right. Now, do you remember the response of the three Hebrew young men in Daniel chapter 3? When these young men are threatened with death, if they do not bow down to the king in the king's image of gold, this is how they replied in Daniel chapter 3. Verse 16, they said, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, yeah, yeah. we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us <coughs> out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, right. nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. So their response was that they were fully confident that God would deliver them from the hands of the king, either from the flame or through the flames. Amen? So either the flame would not harm them, or the flames would extinguish their lives, in which case they would go to heaven. So either way, their God would deliver them. Amen? And I believe that Paul is saying something similar. God will either deliver him from prison by his release, or he would deliver him by death. Either way, Paul said he would be free. 
Yeah. Wow. Right. And this is the kind of attitude that we can also display when we face trials and we face difficulties and and, and for us and, and for God is still able, we have to understand, to deliver his people. Right? We may not always understand the circumstances and the situations that we're in. And we don't always have to have the answers. But we must have a confidence and an understanding of who Jesus Christ is. Right? Because if I know that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, if I believe and know that my God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that I could ever ask or think do, then my confidence rests in him. Not in my situations, not in my abilities, not in my talents, not in my finances, not in my connections in this world, right? right? Not in my pedigree, not in my culture, but my confidence rests, my confidence rest in Jesus Christ. Yes, yes. Amen. 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 He is the author and the finisher of my faith. Right. Yes. And therefore, if he's the author and the finisher of my faith, then I understand that whatever situation I am going through, I can trust him and know that he sees where I'm at. You know, we love to quote the scriptures, ask and shall see, seek and shall find it, knock and it shall be open unto you. And we take hold of that and whatever situation we're in, we're saying, okay, I'm going to ask and God's going to give it to me. Right. But he doesn't promise no. that in that essence. Right. We can ask for certain things and ask that you shall receive. But the way we receive it and when we receive it is not always the way and when we want it. Right. God, I'm tired of this sickness. Deliver me from it. Yes. And then they're doing a homecoming celebration for you. He did deliver you from it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> that's not what you were thinking when you were asking to deliver you from it. You weren't expected to be laid up in a casket. Right? Sometimes we say we, are, we have not because we ask not. That's what the scripture is saying, right? But in reality, you know, and, and, I, and I love to joke about this, but really, in reality, when we look at this and we see what God is showing us here from the Apostle Paul, that Paul, who is going through so much, can turn around and say, you know what? No matter what I'm going through, right. if it helps others to draw strength in their relationship with God, I've accomplished something. Right. If others can see that they can have a relationship with Jesus Christ because of what I'm going through, then the furtherance of the gospel is happening. Right. When Paul was chained to these guards and he's and they're listening to his communication and his conversations and they're, they're hearing him dictate his letters, all of this is being fed into them. And they may stand there and not ask any questions, but they're absorbing all of this. And then they go back and they share with others, or, or they'll say, you know, this is what I heard this crazy Paul saying today. And another says, wow, you know, that might make some sense. What kinds of conversations were being held while Paul was there? Because in that time when you were in prison, he could have people come and visit him. And they would. They would come and visit him. And when they would come and visit him, they were so excited when they left that they said, if Paul can be this way and this strong, yeah, yeah, yeah. then my goodness, it should be much easier for me because I don't have all of that latched onto me. So Paul's confidence came from two sources. First, he knew that he had been and would continue to be sustained by the prayers of his good friends at Philippi. How important is prayer? That's why we have our prayer request chart, and that's why you have the booklets that you or receive your prayer and praise. Prayer is important. God answers through prayer. So Paul was saying, I can be sustained because I know that there are people that are praying for me. Right. When we think about Brother Bobby and all that he's gone through with his cancer and, and how the doctors are saying that the, the rare form that he has, that he's not supposed to be getting these test results back that he's getting. 
well, why is he getting back such yeah. positive yeah. results? Yeah. It's because yeah. we have power right. yeah. 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 And we see his strength gaining, and we see him on Sunday mornings, and, and we get excited when we yeah. see him. And he gives us even more faith because we know that our prayer is an action, right. and God is hearing and doing what needs to be done. Amen. So the second source of Paul's confidence comes that Paul knew that he could depend on the help given by the Holy Spirit. You see, there are times that we have to face things and we're all by ourselves, so we say. Oh, yes. But all I have to do is call on his name. Yes, that's right. Amen. And let the Holy Spirit come and, and dwell in me and, and, and direct my path. The Lord himself made the promise of the Holy Spirit's help, of its comfort, and of its encouragement to believers. He told the apostles, you know, to wait for me. In the upper room, right? We were told the way to the upper room right. so they could be endued with power oh, from on high. Right, right. And the Holy Spirit would come. And that would be resident in each one of us. And, and we believe in that born again experience that, as Acts chapter 2 shows us, it illustrates. And, and we've seen it in our lives, many of us, how the Spirit guides us and lifts us. And that's why we often say, I must decrease and He must yes, increase in my right. life. Yes, amen. So, just before Jesus went to Calvary, Jesus assured his disciples in John chapter 14, verses 16 and 17, and this is what he said. He said, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him. For he dwells with you and will be in you. Hmm. Paul in Rome, under house arrest, facing a stern trial and even a possible execution, he experiences the peace and the encouragement of the Holy Spirit. Right. So the question I asked at the very beginning is, I said, how do we have joy and how do we make it through the holiday seasons and every day, whether it's holiday or not? How do we make it through our sicknesses? How do we make it through the stresses of our job? How do we make it through all the complications of family life? So the Spirit, the Holy Spirit guides us. Yeah. Lord, I must decrease and you must increase in my life. Amen. Amen. Yeah. So we can be joyful. In spite of what others do to us, right? Amen. I mean, I mean, think about that. We can be joyful in spite of our circumstances, because when our joy is connected to the advancement of the gospel, mm -hmm. rather than our physical comfort, stop looking at what you get out of it. Yeah, right. go ahead. Right. Uh -huh. Right. Yeah. Why do we have road rage? Because when somebody feels offended, they think they have the right yes. to give it back. Yeah. Uh -huh. But how about giving back some love? Yeah. The Bible tells us to love our enemies. That's right. Yeah. And these aren't even enemies. These are just yeah. people driving down the road that are stressed out and, and have all these issues in their own life. And unfortunately, you just happen to be at that place when they're in a rush to get somewhere or they're angry about something and, and they take it out on you. And so how do you handle it? Smile, wave, begin to pray for them. Yeah. Instead of flipping them the bird oh, yeah. or, or hitting the gas pedal and trying to race up and cut them off because they cut you off. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's a simple thing, but that's we see that happening around us all the time. Yes. I mean, the tragedies and what's going on in our world. Yes. Yeah. And we play with these petty things. Yes. The tragedy last night of the shooting in oh, California. Yeah. Twelve people killed. Sad. Several weeks ago in Pittsburgh, in the synagogue, all those wonderful people killed. Sad. Somebody that just hated Jews, but he had a right to go out and do that. But the community comes together and says, we're not going to allow that attitude to change our attitude. Yeah. Right. As a matter of fact, if anything, we're going to show how great our God is and how big our God is. So we can be joyful in spite of what others do when we don't care who gets the credit as long as Jesus Christ is glorified. That's the bottom line, especially in ministry. You can't always be worried about who gets the credit.
just got to make sure that God gets the credit. That's right. Amen. Oh, somebody may be in the front of the line, and somebody might get the limelight for that moment, but it does not matter because our treasures are being stored up in heaven. Right. Amen. Don't right. worry about that. In the workplace, it's the same thing. You may be helping somebody at work on a project, and, and all of a sudden they get all the credit, and you're sitting there saying, well, I did all the work. And then all of a sudden your attitude changes and you're like, I'm not going to work anymore. I'm not going to work as hard. Or, or you end up not liking that person and trying to find a way where you can get the credit for yourself and slam them down. Trying to step on that ladder to, to get higher. But no, as a Christian, that's not how we're to act. Right. It's so making just my example of being humble and, and just say, hey, you know, and, and letting me get that credit and, and just living my life. That they turn around and they look and say, you know what, they didn't even fight for that. Look at the example. Look at the integrity of that individual. Because nobody can take your integrity from you. You have to give it up. That's right. That's I've learned right. that in my own life when I've given up my own integrity. Yeah. And when you give up your integrity, it's so hard to get it back. Right. You have to work very hard and very long to get that back. Mm -hmm. Remember, that's that's a gym that you don't want to give up. So easily to get rid of, so hard to get back. Right. And then third, we can be joyful in spite of how uncertain the future may be. Look, because joy is not the self-satisfied delight that everything is going our way, but settled peace of knowing that God is in control even in the most difficult of circumstances. Right, amen. We're right. uncertain of our future. Yeah, right. The Bible says we have no promise of tomorrow. Right, right? that's right, amen. So do I focus on that and become negative and anxious? No, I just... Trust in my God. Right, yes, amen. And trust that He knows exactly where I am and what I need. Yes. When we look at all of the things that are happening around us in society, we can be frustrated and, 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 and react to it in a negative way. Some people, right. the way they react, I was talking just the other day as I wrap up here, let me just share this with you. I was talking um, the other day, and so when we were talking about the elections, the midterm elections, and we we're saying, you know, why are the pollsters getting all of this wrong? And, and the response is because nobody wants to tell anybody the way they're voting or who they vote for. Because the moment you say, I'm voting for so-and-so, all of a sudden you get people that get angry with you. Yes. And there have been friendships that have been broken just because somebody voted for one person. Yes. And a lot of people are saying, I keep that quiet now. And our society today is saying, I'm not party loyal. Many people say, they say I'm voting based on the individual. And then there are those that aren't party loyal. So the pollsters can't get it right because anybody's keeping it zipped or they're not telling the truth, right? So they can't figure it out. Yeah, right. I mean, that, that's where it's at. And so do I focus on all of that? No. I know that I must serve and live a life that is morally upright. That's right. That I must be an ambassador for my Lord and Savior. Amen. And it's not something that I have to do. But as a child of God, it's something I want to do. Yes, amen. Right. As children, we want to please our parents. Right. Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. I want to please Him. Right. He created me so that I can worship Him. Amen. Not worship myself, not worship my job, not worship my money, but to worship Him. Right. And so to find joy in this upcoming season, in every day's life, is to find peace in our Lord and Savior. Yes. Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much for listening and joining with us tonight. I look forward to sharing with you again on Sunday at 11 a.m. God bless you all. Amen. Amen. Amen.